So hello and welcome to the UTMIST academic talk series. So for those of you who are new to UTMIST, I would like to just quickly introduce UTMIST and myself. So my name is Richard Xu and I'm one of the event organizers at UTMIST together here with Annie Liu and Daniel Jai. So what is UTMIST? We are a community of machine intelligence enthusiasts and our goals are to connect students with graduate students, professors and industries in the field to provide opportunities and skill sets to get involved and ultimately to clear the mist around machine intelligence. So in the chat, Daniel will include some links for everyone to get more involved with UT Mist. And so if you're new to machine learning, we have free courses that are designed by students for students called MIST 101 and MIST 102. If you're interested in entrepreneurship, we have an upcoming speaker series with some really, really exciting startups and cool founders. Finally, we have our academic talk series like the one today, where we invite distinguished researchers to share the latest breakthroughs and applications related to machine intelligence. So today is our first academic talk series of 2021. And we're very thrilled to have Professor Michael Hoffman with us today for leading the speaker series. He will share about his work, Segway, a machine uh, widely used uh, open source software for genomic data analysis. So during the seminar, if you have any question, please send them in the chat. However, I would like to ask the audience to keep your camera and mic turned off during the talk to avoid distractions. So everyone, please welcome Professor Michael Hoffman. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for your kind introduction and for the uh, invitation here today. So I'm going to be talking about Segway and the Graphical Models Toolkit. Um, so first, I'd like to, to start by talking a little bit about maps. So if you're looking at a, a map of an area, you know, usually there are all sorts of layers of information that you can put on top of the map. Sorry, having a little trouble here. <laughs> Give me one second. I lost my presenter view. Here we go. Can y'all see this just fine? Looks like yes. OK. Um, so you know, if you have a map, there's all sorts of data that you can put on top of, of a map. All right. So you might have information about where streets are. All right, you might have information on where buildings are, vegetation. These are all different layers of information um, that go onto what is essentially a coordinate system. All right, and so defining your coordinate system is important. But in the end, you can get an integrative map that has all of this, all of this stuff together. Um, the genome is is no different. So I'm going to talk. A little bit about the the human genome. Um, this is the same for the genome of all complex organisms. Um, basically, there is a structure of the genome. You know, you've probably heard of the sequence of the human genome is a bunch of A's, A's, C's, G's, and T's, right? And it's divided up into into chromosomes. So you can see here. Um, a single chromosome, um, and humans have 23 pairs of those usually. Um, but if you zoom in through several several orders of magnitude of magnification, you can get down to where you can actually see the DNA double helix with individual rungs in the, the ladder there. Um, and so each one of these rungs represents a letter, A, C, G, or T, um, and that's what makes up the human genome. But essentially that just provides us with what is essentially a base map, right? So it provides us with a, a coordinate system um, that we can put all sorts of other information on top of. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the sorts of things that you can add on top of that. If you zoom out just a little bit, you can find that the DNA is usually wrapped around these, these proteins, um, these collection of proteins, which are called nucleosomes. Right? And those occur at specific parts of the genome. And there are you know, regions that are between the nucleosomes, the regions of what is so-called open chromatin. 
where these nucleosomes are change from one cell type to another, right? So you've got millions of cells in your body. Um, they all roughly have the same genome sequence, um, but there are many different kinds of cells, right? So you've got muscle cells, you've got brain cells, you've got liver cells. They all do very different things based on the same program in, in the sense of text of the, gene, the, the DNA sequence. And what changes, what allows the cell to know what kind of cell it is, is sort of layers of information that go on top of the DNA. And, and this is one example of that, right? So where, where, the, where the nucleosomes are, where the regions of open chromatin are, and so on. And so there are techniques that you can use to measure these, these sorts of things. Um, people have been very excited about high throughput genome sequencing. People sometimes call it next generation genome, genome sequencing because you can sequence a lot, of, a lot of genomes, right? You can get a lot of DNA sequence. Um, I'm, I'm excited about this, not because I can find out what the genetic sequence of a bunch of individual people are, but because you can set up an experiment to interrogate different physical chem and chemical properties of the genome and different human cell types. So essentially you are, again, adding on different layers of, of the map by doing this. So, you know, one of these layers is where open chromatin is, right? There's another layer, which is where the genes actually are. You can use things like, like RNA-seq will tell you, will tell you that. Um, and you can construct a, a model of the genome that tells you not just where the genes are, right, but where all the important regulatory switches are that control the, um, the genes that are executing in different cell types, right? And so this is what really makes the difference between one cell type and, and another. So we've developed a, a methodology, which we call semi-automated genome annotation. And what we do in, in semi-automated genome annotation, or, or SAGA, as, as we often call it, um, is we take multi, multivariate genomic signal data, and we do unsupervised clustering at the same time as segmenting the data. Um, so here you can see what we have are basically three, three data sets, right? And each one of these, we've got the x-axis is position along a chromosome um, of the genome, right? And the y-axis for each one of these things is some sort of signal, right? So it's just a number that's associated with whatever property we're trying to measure at every position in the genome. And essentially you can think of this again as the, the position you know, gives us a, a map and we can lay these three different data sets on top of it and you can lay on many more, right? So there are actually thousands of data sets like this where you can find a number for every position in the genome and it describes some aspect of the human genome in a particular cell type. So what we do in the semi-automated genome annotation task is we do pattern discovery, right? And we um, use that to annotate the genome. So we assign a simple, a simple label to each part of the genome, totally partitioning the genome, right? And we can visualize very complex data um, in a very simple way, breaking things down into simple categories. And we can also use that for further interpretation, right? So some of the, the raw data is very hard to work with, but if you can convert it to sort of discrete um, labels and segments like this, it becomes a lot easier to, to work with. Um, so we created this method for semi-automated genome annotation, which is called Segway, because it is a way of, of segmenting the genome. We published this a few years ago, but are still working on it a lot. And I'm going to blow up the little cartoon I was showing you earlier of three data sets along, along the genome. So again, we have an x-axis where each where along the x-axis, we have each position in the human genome. And along the y-axis for each data set, we have signal. And the signal is a function of the number of cells within whatever sample we have that shows some property. And the property might be, say, open chromatin, or might be some sort of covalent modification of uh, the genome sequence or, or whatever. What we do is we partition the genome into non-overlapping segments. Um, and we assign each segment to a label from a, a finite set. Um, so here we have a set 
zero, one, and two. And then we change around the boundaries of the segments so you maximize similarities into labels. All right, so here you can see an example of this zero pattern, which is low, high, low, this one pattern, which is high, low, high, and, and so on. Um, and we have here another way of representing this, these, these patterns. So here I can show you an example where we had, I believe, 31 different data sets. All right, so here are 30, 31 different data sets, and we decided to find 25 different labels within, within that. And this heat map essentially shows you the, the parameters of the model that Segway learns. Um, it essentially finds recurring patterns within this data. So you can see some of the recurring patterns, like you can see, for example, you know, there's, there's this block here where there's a lot of red, and red means that there's high signal in all of these, these different data sets, except for maybe the four down at the bottom, which is we have this separate little cluster here that just has, has those four. And then you can see some other, you know, sort of super clusters within this, this data. Um, the hierarchical clustering at the top makes that easier to, to find as well, right? So some where, where things are mostly, mostly off in all of the different data sets and things where there are often certain subset of the data sets and so on and so forth. Um, the, the thing is that after doing this, we can then assign some sort of label, some sort of meaning to every position in the human genome, right? And so a lot of these are things like, you know, where the starts, middles, and genes of, right? But there are also things like where distal um, enhancers, so, so important gene regulatory elements, which is that let us determine which kind of, of cell type we're looking at, and other things like CTCF. Um, you can also look at, you know, their signals, this, these things I call R whatever, are repressed regions of the genome, right? So sometimes genes that are not active in this particular cell type. That's as important in determining what cell type something is as which um, as, as which genes are turned on, or also looking at which genes are turned off. Um, and then there's this, this final group here, this D group or, or dead group, which really kind of shows the power of using unsupervised learning for this approach is we discovered that there are these vast regions of the genome, actually most of the genome, where there's no signal in any, any data type, right? And there are a variety of different reasons for that, but the, the interesting thing is this was something that no one had really noticed before. And we noticed it here because we were doing some sort of unsupervised learning. Um, but by the way, if you look in the actual papers that came out, we, you know, people thought the dead was, was politically incorrect. So we instead described them as quiescent in the, in the papers. So once you learn all of these patterns, you can then go back and apply them to, to the genome and you can take the, the sort of signal data. So here are these, these bottom data sets. This is real data that looks very much like the cartoon examples I showed you earlier. And with a model like the one we showed you before, you can identify some of these, these recurring patterns, right? So the model can identify a, a pattern um, of what is essentially between two, um, two open chromatin, um, sorry, two, two nucleosomes, so a region of open chromatin, right? It can also find, you know, where the flanking nucleosomes are, right? And these are things that if you look, look at the top here, you can see the annotation that comes out of our, our software and you can see that these sort of discrete labels correspond to sort of things that you can see visually um, and also a lot of things that you might not be able to see um, visually as well. Um, so this is just sort of a, a quick demonstration of how we work with this sort of large scale genomics data in computational biology. And I'm gonna go, go now in a second to sort of a less, less biology focused um, part of the talk. But before I do that, does anyone have any questions on this? If you do, please feel free to type in the chat window or you can turn your video on and, and ask your question then. I'm not seeing any questions now, but if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to type them in the chat window. I'm trying to keep an eye on it. Um, so 
Segway is implemented using something called the Graphical Models Toolkit. So it is a general purpose toolkit for probabilistic inference in, in speech language, activity recognition, and, and genomics. Um, and it lets you do a lot of different sorts of of probabilistic reasoning. Um, so the interesting thing about probabilistic models um, is that often you can make direct interpretations about the parts of the model, which is, um, you know, the, you, you set up a model based on a system that you might have some amount of understanding, understanding of, which separates this a little bit from neural networks where people interpret them usually in some sort of post hoc way by, you know, creating additional systems on top of neural networks to try to make them interpretable. So I'm going to show you um, the sorts of things you can do using the, the graphical model toolkit. And if you're trying to do this using genomic data, um, Segway allows you to, to do that quite easily. Graphical model toolkit was originally written for, for speech recognition for speech recognition purposes um, as sort of a inspiring application. Um, so here I'm going to talk, I'm going to show you a probabilistic model and I'm going to show you it using a variety of different languages. So one language is the sort of graphical language, right? So in the graphical language, um, here I'm showing you a model. It has, it has one, one node, right? The model, this, this node is a hidden random variable, which is called Q, All right? There are other ways of, of looking at this as well. Essentially, any sort of graphical representation here um, is actually just a way of representing a, a system of equations, All right? And so here, what we have this random variable Q, essentially we have a probability that Q is equal to some particular value that fits into it. And we'll call that lowercase Q. It's the realization of, of Q. And there's a set of parameters that we learn and we'll just squeeze those all into, into theta. And that's, that's essentially what this very simple graphical version of this says is that there's some random variable Q. Um, it has discrete values from some set. So, you know, Q, might be, you know, in, in the set, you know, zero through 25, if we're looking at the case of my uh, Segway model from before where we had 25 different labels, um, that's one way you can do it. Um, and having constructed this, you can get some actual data and you can see how well the data fits the model, right? So um, let's say I have a model where I have Q can be either zero or one, right? And let's say that there's a um, probability that Q is, is zero is 25%. And the probability that Q equals one is 0 0.775. This is essentially a full parameterization of the model that, that is described by this little, this little graph here. Um, what you can do is you can come in with, with some, some data, right? So here's the param so, so what I've shown you here are essentially the parameters. Um, and you can um, say, you know, if I come in with some data and the data is just zero, what is the, the likelihood of getting zero for this value of Q given these parameters? Well, you can see quite easily here, it's 0.25, right? Um, this seems kind of trivial, but this is kind of a, a, a little building block for more complex, complex models. Um, so there's another way that you can describe this as well. And this is the um, graphical model toolkit language. So it's this sort of language that, that looks like C and essentially is a way of, of describing random variables and how they, they interact with each other. So you can have a variable. I usually give my variables here longer names than single variables. So state is the same thing as Q. Right, you can tell it what kind of variable it is. This one is discrete rather than continuous. It's hidden, which means we don't 
know what it is, we, we are essentially inferring values of it. And it's cardinality too, right? So that, that means that the, the domain is, is zero and one. And then you tell it what the parents, parents of the variable are. All right, and I'm just going to say the parents are nil. We'll talk about more about the parents in a second. And we have this dense CPT start state. And, and CPT means conditional probability table. It's something that will allow us uh, to, given a, a table of, of you know, parents, some parent, it will tell us what we might expect for a child random variable. This is, this is a, uh, a model that only has one variable, so there are no parents. Um, so essentially, this is just telling us what the starting state is. You know, it's not relative to anything else. And you define your parameters in a separate separate file. Right? And the parameter language, you know, is can be a little bit. Um, esoteric at, at times, but essentially, you know, we've said here a bunch of conditional probability tables. We actually just have one conditional probability table. Um, it's called start state. Um, the, the output of this conditional probability table has cardinality two, and here are the two values that, that define that. Essentially, this is what that represents, saying that probability of Q equals zero is 0.25, probability of Q equals one is 0.75. All right, so this is as simple as, simple as it gets, um, and you can infer, you know, you, you set this model up and then you come in with new data um, and the data will be either zero or one and the model can tell you how likely it is it, is it that you got that zero or one given this, given this model and parameters not very interesting on its own, but it is a, a key building block for a, more, for a more interesting model where we add this additional variable. Okay, so I'm gonna have an observed variable here, right? So it's filled in, that means, that's why it's observed. i uh, sorry, being observed means that we fill it in in this sort of graphical language. Um, I'm using a, a circle because this is a continuous value instead of a, a discrete value. Um, and essentially that changes the, the equation of the model down here. So we've added a little bit more of it. So now if we have an equ equation for the likelihood of the whole model, it's not just about what the single value of the hidden variable is, but also the value of this observed variable. And the expansion of that is the probability of the hidden variable, hidden variable on its own, and the probability that the observed variable has the realization that it has, given, this is the important part, given the, the um, particular value of the hidden variable at this point. All right, so it's this given here, that's what make things, makes things conditional. And we, we represent the conditional relationship between these two variables using the arrow. All right, so that says that what, whatever the value of x is here, it's dependent on whatever the value of q is here. Um, so this is a, a generative, generative model. Um, and that's how it works. Um, so in the GMTK language, we add this additional variable. So I'm gonna call it OBS to mean, mean observed. We say it's continuous, uh, it's observed. The zero to zero just, just tells you where in the input data file it is. And now when we look at the conditional parents, right? it's not nil. We say that there is a conditional relationship between state and OBS, and that's that's how we do it by, you know, looking at a conditional. Sorry, by putting the conditional parent here, and then we have another um, another set of parameters. Um, the 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 parameter that will go from a state um, to a particular set of of observations, All right? And so I'm not gonna get into the details of this, but you can use things like Gaussian distributions to represent different sorts of, of um, conditional, sorry, different sorts of values for the continuous data. So you might expect that, like, let's say that you have 
um, two different distributions of, of data for some continuous value, right? And one looks something like this, right? And then there's another one that looks something like this. And the model essentially knows which one you're looking at based on what the hidden value of, of Q is and you use that mapping information and something else um, to go on. So this is all very interesting, I'm sure, for you, uh, where we're looking at these one, one variable. But where, where it really starts to become interesting is where we start adding in additional information. We start making this dynamic. So we, you know, instead of just having Q or X, we change this to Q0 and X0, right? We changed the realizations here too, and all of the random variables. And in the GMTK language file, we add this frame zero, bracketing all of the stuff that we, we have here. The reason we do this is because we can then add a, a frame one, right? So we can add an additional hidden variable, um, frame one. So here's the hidden variable that we've added, right? And then this changes the equation of the model again. So now instead of just having, you know, single realization of Q, you have the sequence Q0, Q1, and we can just call that Q0 to one. Um, and we still have the same first two, first two parts of what's on the right of the equation, but now we've added this additional term which is again, a conditional probability, a conditional probability that Q1 has some particular value given the value of Q0. Um, so you can see all of that implemented here in the GMTK language. We again have the variable state, same type, but the conditional parents have changed. Instead of them being nil, you now the conditional parents are the state from the previous frame, right? And then we have another conditional probability table that allows us to go from one state to, to another. And so that's essentially just a multinomial distribution. You can go from, you know, you have certain values of Q0, you have two possible values, and given what the value of Q0 is, there's a certain value for Q1. And usually you set these things, sorts of things up so that there is, you know, um, a high likelihood of continuing in the, in the same state and a lower likelihood of, of changing it. The final little piece of this very simple model is we add an additional observation at frame one. Um, it's identical to the observation at frames, frame zero and its relationship um, to each other. Um, the final, final piece that we will add to this model is this. In GMTK language, we say the chunk is from one to one. And essentially what that does, this makes this a, a dynamic model, where instead of just defining something at two positions, we now define this at sort of a generic T and, and a generic T plus one. All right, and what we've defined here is um, a dynamic Bayesian network. Um, once you've defined this little template, you have your, your what's called the prologue, the first, first frame, and the chunk is something that gets repeated over and over and over again, All right? So you can take that simple little template and make copies of it for as long as you have data. All right, so people would do this with audio data. You define a, a, a simple little model and it can easily be extended to the full length of whatever data you have. You can use this for, um, for genomic data as well, right? And essentially um, what we have down here, we've just added this little, this little term of multiplying for every value of T up to the max value of T, which we'll call capital T, of the same sort of chain of, of conditional probabilities. So the, um, you know, again, this is, this is the simplest, one of the simplest kinds of dynamic Bayesian network. This, this is a representation of a hidden Markov model, and this is a way that you can make a hidden Markov model um, quite simply. Um,
So let me tell you a little bit more about, and feel free again to post questions in the chat if you have any, um, about how we use this for, for segmentation. Um, that problem, the semi-automated genome annotation problem that I, I showed you before. Essentially, we construct a dynamic Bayesian network with, with GMTK that allows us to take in not just a, a single um, observed data set, but we actually have multiple observed data sets. And you can have individual parameters for the relationship between whatever the state value is um, and, um, and the Gaussian distributions that we use to characterize um, different signal signals and the continuous observed data at every every position. So what Segway does, if you're not if you're not a genome person, probably the sorts of data files on the left may not help you very much. But basically, there are are two major components to Segway. There's there's a train command or train train subcommand and there's an annotate subcommand. And so you've loaded a bunch of data and Segway will automatically generate the GMTK language structure for you. And it will learn a bunch of discovered parameters um, for the data that you have. This is the semi-automated part of it, the unsupervised part. You can also, and people have done this, you know, if you have a particular model you want to test or you want to look at, you can actually supply your own parameters. You can construct your own, your own model in whatever way you want using the sort of um, probabilistic language I told you about as, as building blocks. And then there are a variety of tools in a package called SegTools that you can use to make um, colorful visualizations of, of what you what you get here. Um, so what Segway does is it creates GMTKL structure and parameter files for semi-automated genome annotation. Um, and then it you know does a bunch of stuff that essentially makes it easier for you to use GMTK on, on genomic data. We usually work with really large data and that often requires um, using a, a cluster compute system in order to work with that kind of data. Um, and Segway supports several different kinds of, of cluster systems as well as local, local multi, multi-processing. And one of the things we're working on is, is breaking Segway down into a modular system that you can use to separate out different parts of this. So, you know, right now it's kind of monolithic. There's a um, Segway model that is a standard model for, for semi-automated genome annotation, but you can replace this with whatever model you, you want. People have used it for doing things like um, discovering footprints of, of open chromatin specifically and um, interpreting RNA-seq data. Um, so, you know, there are a variety of ways you can break this down. And one, one of the simplest way is to take this command line software and break it down into smaller commands so that people can create a, a script and just, you know, maybe, you know, run, um, you know, initialize the, the model files, but then here you, you know, supply your own parameters um, instead of using the ones that Segway generates automatically. Um, and you don't actually do any of this training stuff and you can just skip to the, skip to the annotation. Um, these are all things that people, people can do to work with other sorts of genomic data. Um, there are a lot of interesting bells and whistles that we can um, take advantage of the dynamic Bayesian network uh, formulation to do. One thing is that we have a principled way of handling missing, missing data. So this problem in genomics is often there are certain regions of the genome where we don't really know um, what values there are in particular data sets due to you know, annoying technical, technical issues. Um, so there are a variety of ways of doing, dealing with that. Uh, usually what people do is instead of working at the full one base pair resolution in the genome, they will downsample to, to looking at 200 base 
base pair regions and using that to kind of smooth over any, any missing data. We don't actually have to do that because we, we can use dynamic Bayesian, what's called a dynamic Bayesian multi-net. Um, essentially, we add a additional indicator variable for every observed variable. Um, and that indicator variable, it's either zero, um, meaning that there is no data, data is, is missing at that particular position, or it's one, meaning the data is present at that position. Um, and Segway and GMQK are constructed so that if it's if this is zero, essential, essentially, um, you will you can treat the model as if you know all of this stuff is edited out at that particular position. Um, so you can expand that little that little template to a variety of of data sets um, at every position of the genome, um, and it's a nice nice capability to have. Um, another thing that we can do is sometimes people want to see um, with it, you know if you just throw all your data at a simple hidden Markov model, you can sometimes get segments. Um, that are quite short. And sometimes people want to see not just, you know, what is the shortest distance behavior that they can see recurring, but they want to see behavior over much longer regions. And you can enforce a length distribution by adding some additional capacity to the, the dynamic Bayesian network. And essentially, what we can do is add this, add this apparatus up here, um, where wherever we change the, the state value, the value of, of Q sub T, there's a countdown variable that gets reset to some value. So let's say it gets reset to 200, right? And then you can set up discrete, uh, sorry, you can set up um, um, non-probabilistic deterministic relationships between variables such that, you know, let's say this is CT, we'll call this CT plus one. You can say CT plus one is always equal to CT minus one. Um, and then you can set up other variables, right? So, you know, this transition variable will have it set up so that it is only one once this value is, is zero, right? So essentially what, and then you set up the relation, a switching parent relationship with the segment segment label here, such that if this is zero, it's always just a copy of this, and if it's one, it's probabilistically picked from a different multinomial distribution. Um, oops, I lost my my zoom there for a second. Um, so. Yeah, there, there are all sorts of interesting things you can do. The, the, the real power of this, this system is instead of having to write a bunch of custom code to implement um, semi-Markov models or other you know, variations of hidden Markov models, you can kind of just dream up um, a different network to work with, a different um, relationship of probabilistic variables to, to each other. Um, and then let the graphical model toolkit do do all of the implementation work for you. So we have some other you know fun alternate models that we can use for this. You can set up a hierarchical model where you have you know two layers of of segments. So we call these segments and and super segments. Again, this is something that's pretty easy to set up. All you need to do is is add an additional variable to your your gene decay language file. Um, we've done things where we work with RNA seq data, and the interesting thing about RNA seq data is that it is stranded. So you have some data that runs along one side of the genome, and other data that runs along the other side of the genome. And the way we work with this is is simply by running two copies of the same same model over the data, depending on which direction which direction they they run in. Um, you can add, you know, do other things like add in um, genome sequence. Um, so it doesn't all have to be continuous data. You can add in relationship between uh, different data sets. So let's say you have um, certain data sets that are from some cell type, certain data sets that are constructed using the same technique. You know, you don't want necessarily want to treat all of those things as as independent. You know, other sorts of 
of things like, you know, what is the yeah, particular position in the genome? Um, what is that base pair in the chimpanzee genome sequence? Um, you know, what is that um, base pair in different human populations, right? If you look at an African population, is it different from a, a European population and so on? Um, Let's see, there's a question. Um, there's a question from Sasha Goldman, um, who is, so is that just enforcing a minimum segment length? So I, I apologize, I didn't see your question earlier. Um, so I think the question was on, probably on this, this slide. So yeah, essentially what I described is enforcing a minimum um, segment length, but you can probably imagine there are other ways of doing this where you can enforce a maximum segment length instead, right? So you just set up your rules so the countdown gets to unto zero um, instead of, you know, having a you may change probabilistically rule, you set it to a you must change, um, you must change deterministically uh, rule. And Albert Chang is asking about the the RNA seq data. I think what is the the advantage to looking at both sense and anti sense sequencing sense sequencing data? Um, so the interesting thing about all of this data, you know, statisticians love working with data that's independently and identically distributed. Genomic data is never that. Right. There's always strong, strong dependence from from one position to another in the, the genomic data. Um, like you could probably see from the fact that, you know, I was showing you stuff that looked like looked like this. Um, you know, if you're if you're at position here, right, and you want to guess what the the data at this position is going to be, um, it's probably going to be something that is within some some range of where you were before. It's not going to be just totally random noise um, where it changes at every every single position. Um, so the things are not you know independent in that way. Um, and genes are defined on particular strands of the, the genome. So if you look back at the original Segway model that I, I showed you near near the beginning, you know, you can see that we learn things like gene start, gene middle, and gene end. Um, and if you're working with stranded data, um, you want to be able to learn the the transition between these uh, between these different sorts of labels, and becomes very very important. Um, and the the transition is going to follow the orientation of the strand that the data came from. Uh, so basically, we can't um, that that sort of data doesn't it didn't work well until we we tried adding um, that that sort of technique to work with independently stranded data and different runs of the runs of the method. So I'll say that I always do the simplest possible thing that might work. And if it doesn't work, then do something slightly more complicated. So I'll say that initially we started, we, we didn't have that, have that capability and we wanted to see if we could work with stranded data and, and we couldn't. Um, so I am going to, um, just talk a little bit more about the software and kind of wrap up here. So Segway is something that's available for free. You can go to segway.hoffmanlab.org um, and, and check it out. Um, it's also something that's available on the Bioconda system. Um, if you've ever worked with bioinformatics software, you know, it could sometimes be a problem to install dependencies and things like that. Um, Conda provides a system that makes it really easy to install scientific software and, and in general, and the Bioconda channel makes it easy to install um, uh, to install bioinformatics software in particular, um, so that you really can uh, use a single command to, to install both Segway and all of its prerequisites. Um, finally, um, you know, before we go on to see if there are any other questions, I just want to thank the the people um, in my lab. I want to particularly thank the people who work on on Segway, who are those people um, in blue here. So we've got 
Eric. Uh, Eric Roberts is a programmer who's the main maintainer of Segway. Uh, Mikhail Mendez is a computer science PhD student in my lab who's been developing um, additional additional methods for Segway. So the, the stranded model that I talked about is something that he's been working on. Um, and Aparna Gopalakrishnan, um, who has been developing easier ways to use the, the GMTK features and to, to add your own you know, models using GMTK. Uh, I wanna thank my, my collaborators, especially Jeff Bilms, the original author of GMTK. Uh, I wanna thank my funders. And finally, I wanna thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, one other thing I, sh I should mention is uh, we are looking for um, undergraduate researchers um, in my lab. So um, right now, the, the Department of Medical Biophysics has a, a summer student program. I believe the um, deadline for, the, for that is the uh, 25th. Um, so if you might be interested in doing research in, in my lab, or there are also a number of, uh, you know, several other computational biology focused labs in my department, labs that, um, you know, where people are applying machine learning uh, techniques to, to biological data, you might check out the Medical Biophysics Summer Student Program. Um, and that's it. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Hoffman, for the talk. Um, now we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. If you have any question, you can either type it in the chat box or turn on your video to ask. And I know we already had a couple of questions, mm -hmm. so it's possible if there there might not be more. Okay, well, I think that might that that might be it on the questions. If people have uh, other questions, feel free to get in touch on on Twitter or um, email on my email. <laughs> <laughs> and Fox is kind of a disaster in, in COVID times. Uh, do you have something you want to say, Annie, to finish up? Well, um, thank you everyone for attending. And thank you again, Professor Hoffman, for talking to us about um, Segway. And there's a lot of information. Um, yeah, um, please stay tuned for our future events. We have uh, several academic talks and uh, industry talks throughout this semester and hope to see you in some of our future events. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.